I'm marking. There's no not man marking, are we? It's just marking. What do you mean man marking? It's a team of women. Loose goalkeeping style, and because he had no strength to his body, it looked awkward. Don't slow anything down. Just go for it. I'm like, oof, all right. He threw this ball. <laughs> Honestly, it was the worst throw you've ever seen in the world. I've gone, stop, stop. I said, did you miss his play? So all the girls are going, what do you mean by that? The alarm goes off, and I'm like, I'm going to sneeze. I'm going to sneeze. I feel so I'm going to sneeze. I go, ah, pfft, ah, didn't play again. There I say, a throwaway comment that you did. Yeah. It, it wasn't well received. Brilliant goalkeeper. And he had them, like, go-go gadget arms. His arms. It's like almost giraffe style. Mm. It's like Bambi on ice. What a save from Mark Howard. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Yours Mine Away podcast with me, Mark Howard, and my mate, producer Ben. Today, I'm joined by another top goalkeeper coach that I've had the pleasure of working with. Uh, personally, I must say you're one of the most enthusiastic, if not the most enthusiastic goalie coach. Uh, I'm sure you'll put that across in this episode. Please welcome England women's national team goalkeeper coach, Darren Ward. Thanks for coming in, mate. Nice one. Long time no see. Yeah, it's been too long. Yeah, it has been a long time, a long time. About eight, nine years ago, I think we worked together. Easily. Yeah, it's been a while, but monitored your career since and... Suitably impressed. Still hanging in there. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, st still throwing myself around like an idiot. Yeah, you do right as well. <laughs> Not to mention that Wardy also racked up over 500 professional games and five international caps for Wales. Uh, some massive achievements in there, mate. Uh, yeah, well, if you'd have offered me that at 18 when I left school, I'd have snapped your hand off. So, yeah, buzzing with that. All right, straight into it, Wardy, right? Uh, Mary Earps has just won the FIFA Women's Goalkeeper of the Year. It's an incredible achievement. I know that you've been working for, with her for a long time with England. What's she like? Well, first and foremost, I'm not going to take any credit for it whatsoever because I think that the day-to-day -day work that she does with Wilco up at uh, United uh, is obviously stood her in good stead and we get, to, we get to manage her when she comes on camp. So, yeah, possibly a team, team event, but she's incredibly driven, uh, a wonderful human being, uh, brilliant values, uh, and I think that probably came through in a speech uh, for acceptance of, of the award the other night. But um, yeah, it, she, she turns up every day. And what I mean by that is she's, she's ready to work. She, she drives the sessions and, and really it's a doddle. You just throw the balls up and let her go on with it because you know Mary's going to turn up. Her personality really does come across. Obviously, after winning the Euros, uh, there's a, a really famous image of her dancing, <laughs> hip thrusting on the on the press box. Uh, but yeah, she obviously comes across as so in love with the game and what she does. I think obviously the hardship that she had gone through yep. has really stood her in yep. an amazing state. It's uh, the intensity that she um, sort of turns up with for every camp. And when I talk to her and when I've, I've been up to Carrington and, um, and watched her train, just the intensity and the passion she has for, for goalkeeping, it just oozes out of every pore. And you can't help but not be impressed by it. Right, you recently won the Arnold Clark Cup. Tongue twister for me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and being part of the Euros winning team, there's a World Cup coming up soon. Obviously, winning two trophies already in the past uh, past year, twelve months, uh, is incredible. Uh, and the way that women's football has transformed uh, to be part of it and to be behind the scenes, it, that's a, something that not many people have that insight to it. Can you explain what there it's like? <sighs> Whirlwind, whirlwind. I think uh, if when I, I picked the phone call up um, before before getting an invite to come and cover a camp um, to, to to be sat here today talking to you and reflect on two Arnold Clark Cups, by the way, as well as the Euros, um, it, it's just incredible. And 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 the speed at which it's all happening uh, is is certainly taken me by surprise because I've heard the story of um, some of the former legends that. The pioneers of the game have met them on regular intervals that they come into camp now. And you hear the stories, and I think our girls are, I think we all heard the the story of wanting to build a legacy for, from the Euros uh, and, and sort of stand on the shoulders of those that have gone before. And they're, they're, they're doing it, they're, they're giving it a right good go. Uh, and that passion, governmental level as well, trying to influence people for, for access to PE, access to sport, access to football, for not only boys, but obviously girls. Uh, and the drive and determination from within the camp is just incredible. And it's, it's, it's just really heartwarming to see. They play hard, but it looks like they party hard as well. 
they get it called kick. Yeah, what was yeah. the staff parties like after the Euros? Uh, well, we, we were all there together. Yeah. Um, we were went, it was, we was based uh, just on the Thames in uh, Teddington Lock, um, the Lensbury Hotel. And that was our sort of base camp for the whole of the Euros. And we came back after the, the victory at Wembley. Uh, I don't think anybody went to bed much before 4, 5 or 6 a.m. the following morning. And just everybody in. And when I say players, staff, families, friends... It was an incredible night. Brilliant it was. Yeah, the future of the female football in England, uh, the league's gone from strength to strength and obviously the country doing so well. Uh, what are the hopes for the World Cup? Surely it's got to be challenging, final, semi-final at least. Well, I can tell you into media because you're trying to put the pressures on me to put the, the words <laughs> in my mouth immediately. But no, I'm never going to uh, force you to say anything. No. But, yeah, you're right, though. We're all hoping. Yeah, of course. And we are. It goes without saying. We're all professional. We all want to, to rock up and win. It goes without saying. But we want to play at the highest level, under the highest pressure, and make ourselves proud, make our families proud, and we want to go and deliver. Um, if that means winning, brilliant. If that means coming up a team that on the day are better than us, or a mistake happens, or a referee's decision goes against us, we sometimes can't control them bits. But we'll do everything we can to be prepared and give it our best shot. Oh, super. It's lovely to hear anyway. Mm. All right. Before we crack on with your career, uh, which I can't wait to delve into, I'm going to test your knowledge now with our quiz. Uh, goalie or no goalie? I've made yours really tough, by the Thank way. Thank you. You've got a, a lovely mixture of male and female footballers, celebrities and everything else that goes with this, right? So it's one point for each correct answer. Uh, and it's a simple answer of goalie or no okay. goalie. Don't forget, we got our first uh, 10 out of 10 yeah. today as well, right? Oh, cheers, no pressure. Yeah, cheers. Thanks very much. In our last episode, <laughs> Emily Ramsey, she got, got 10 out of 10, the perfect 10. Yes, Rambo. Yes. So and she was delighted with it as well. We were, to be fair, we all celebrated her. Nice. It was a great... And we got Alex stuff. McCarthy down there on uh, on 4 out of 10. Yeah. That, oh, come on. This, uh, come on. Come yeah, on. it's on. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Right. Number one, Alicia Niha. Goalie. USA and Chicago goalkeeper. I actually Start knew that. A new, there we nice go. Easy yes. one, yeah. <laughs> right. It's just to break you in. Now it gets tough. Michael Amari. He's a goalkeeper as well. He is not a goalkeeper unless you think Stormzy is an international goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> he could be. He's a big yeah. He's a big boy, isn't he? <laughs> he is a big guy. He wouldn't be bad in goal, you know. <laughs> yeah. Your kids would be fuming. You got wonder Stormzy, what size bro. gloves he'd be. <sighs> big. Bigger than my mitts. Right, number three, Catherine Hudson. No goalie. Katy Perry is not a goalie. Yes. This is where we insert into the YouTube clips. Can we just, can we just watch this for a bit longer? <laughs> <laughs> just do some research yeah. now. Nice. Right, number four, Hedvig Lindell. Goalie. You know that one, don't you? Sweden. Sweden, yep. Yeah. 39-year-old Sweden and Jaw Garden women's goalkeeper. Uh, yeah, I was just going to talk about Alessia Russo's back heel, but we can't. Let's move on. There you go. Uh, I knew you'd know some of these from playing against them, so I was like, I'll chuck some of the names in there. I didn't want to make it too hard. All right, number five, Mark Sinclair. No goalie. He is not a goalkeeper. He is too fast, too furious star Vin Diesel. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, a few goalies with hairs like that. Though. <laughs> and a body like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Number six, Diogo Costa. Yes, he's a goalie. You know that one as well, don't you? Yes. Yeah, Portugal yeah. and FC Porto goalkeeper. Yeah. Four out of six, not too bad. You're going all right. Well, I've, re I've reached the bench bar. Yeah, exactly. Right that. <laughs> Fresh is off. Number seven, Barbara Roberts. No goalie. She is not a goalkeeper. It's actually Barbara Millicent Roberts and her fictional boyfriend, Kenneth Carson better known as Barbie and Ken. Oh, there you go. Barbie's got a real name. <laughs> Who knew that? Yeah, I didn't know Barbie had a real name. I'm <laughs> trying to throw you off just with really strange names. So, Number eight, Jamal White. Goalie. Jamaica and Pittsburgh Riverhounds goalkeeper. Yes, he is. Are you on a roll now? Come on, keep it going. Yeah, keep going. Go on then. Number nine, Aurora Mickelson. Goalie. You know that one as well or not? Uh, I've heard Aurora. <laughs> she is a goalkeeper for Norway and Brown, formerly of Spurs. There you go. Yep. Last one. Try and get you to eight. Number 10, Jonas 
Ving Vingegaard. No, he's a cyclist. Yes, he knew this, but I put this one in there for you. <laughs> I know you love your cycling. Yeah, Tour de France winner, yeah. 2022 winner of the Tour de France. That was a nice... The e closest he gets is wearing the yellow jersey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly that. Eight out of ten, Wardy. Well I'll played, mate. I'll take that Super. every day of the week. Put Thank you. you right in the mix. Right, back to your playing career then. As I mentioned before, you have a, had an incredible career, mate. Uh, you came through at Mansfield, uh, but I want to know, what's your first memory of playing in goal? Childhood memory. Oh, blimey. Um, possibly, um, I'm going to say I was eight. Uh, I registered to play for an under-11s team. I think the registration form, the pen slipped on the date of birth. Um, yeah, just just playing with mates, really. Um, a local team, Langol boys. Always a goalie, never an outfielder. Well, I, I was a goalie initially. Um, usual thing. All, all my mates were two years older than me in terms of your playing standard, shall we say. You always played up a few years as a kid, didn't you? And um, yeah, just going, you going goal, and I, and I loved it. Diving around, the, the 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 feel of it, the mud, the ball in the mush, whatever. Uh, it's just it's just what excites you, and. Then when you drop down to my own age group, um, the goalkeeper, well, the manager was the goalkeeper's dad. Uh, yeah, so, of course. <laughs> so I ended up playing right side midfield. Um, believe it or not, I had a change of pace. Um, yeah. So uh, right Where did wing. Did you leave that? Uh, yeah, when I was 16, <laughs> yeah. I left I left that in uh, in Nottingham somewhere. But no, I, I ended up playing right side midfield. So even going into the career when the, when the rule changes um, came in and you had to deal with the football, I always felt a little bit more comfortable because uh, I'd probably had that ground in as a kid. So, uh, But yeah, going back to about eight, I think the first game we lost a ridiculous amount to, to zero. Um, but yeah, fond memories. Just caught that bug. Yeah. Right, so as I said, you came through at Mansfield. Uh, can you explain how different doing a YTS or Academy is compared to now? It, you can't. Yeah. The, how tough was it? it it's ridiculous. Um, from the physical demands, um, because... You were just treated to get fit. You wasn't necessarily um, coached in a sense that you were going to improve technically. We certainly did have any goalkeeper coaches. Uh, that that was in its infancy, uh, especially when I was a, an apprentice. Um, then there's the jobs. That then there's the sweeping the stands after a home match, uh, sweeping the corridors, clearing the, the physios tables and stuff. Had to get moved because it's the medical side of it. It had to be like unbelievably clean so every Friday remember that got turfed out and you were buzzing if you were on kit you were buzzing because you were in that warm laundry and you know it's like Mansfield on a oh, it's <laughs> cold it's bitter <laughs> so yeah uh, chalk and cheese to what it is now but obviously everything's improving for the better uh, for the better in terms of production of players um, but I still don't necessarily agree with the structuring of the leagues and the football and how it does or doesn't prepare you for uh, exposure at the top levels but that's another story yeah obviously you'd have cleaned some people's boots back then like you said you swept out the dressing rooms and the stadiums and that uh, it provides you with that unbelievable grounding which now is almost frowned upon mm. because you're not there to do those jobs mm. you're there to learn how to play football but back then that was character building absolutely 100% uh, and you, you were buzzing when you got your tip at Christmas and it, if you had to go in the dressing room for the first team and the pros with a pot of tea, you had to knock on the door and their respect. You had to wait for them to... There were just little bits, yep. but you had to learn probably where your place was in the pecking order and you had to work your way up that ladder. Uh, and, and without wanting to sound as though people get too much too soon, nowadays uh, it, it comes across as being a little bit easier because health and safety have jumped in, and, and rightly so. There's, there's a time and a place for it all, but uh, certainly the grounding we had, it, it, you know, we, you grew up quickly. I think that's fair to say. I think also back then you, you gained the respect a lot quicker of the first team players. Yep. Uh, you went on to play 97 times for the club, uh, but you broke in at a very young age. But obviously you were around them a bit more because of doing your jobs. Do you think mm. that that helped you and earned their respect? Yeah, without, we, yeah, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, but I mean, I think every dressing room, it can be an unforgiving place. So you, you've got to know how to conduct yourself, how to handle yourself, know where to sit. Know when to go to the toilet. Do you know? Do you know all the little bits? Don't use anyone else's peg. Exactly. Tight timings, everything. Yeah. Uh, so, so learning that uh, and being exposed to it at a younger age certainly, uh, I, I believe, put me in, in in a better position. That when you go out on the grass, uh, and that's another thing. When you go out on the grass, you got to back it up. 
because they suffer no fools. Because especially at Mansfield, when I'm first starting out, with respect to all the pros there, they're still paying their mortgages off. Yeah. So that win bonus on a Saturday night, it makes the world a difference. It might be the difference. I can take my missus out for a beer tonight and have a drink down local, or we're not. Uh, and it, 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 it's that it's that important. Yeah. Um, so so the grounding is key, uh, but you need to go and back it up. Uh, and I think that comes down to people. It's about people skills. It's about having good values, and it's about being a good person. Uh, obviously, you said that you didn't have a goalie coach, and it was right at the start. Mm. Uh, how did you find it, like transitioning from a youth goalkeeper that was just there to primarily make numbers up and get fit, to then like actually need to know the skills to execute on a Saturday? I don't think I ever felt as though I knew what I was doing because ev everything was instinctive and natural. Uh, and of course, you hone your skills and you you become, say, match ready and sharper with your work. But I, I don't think I knew what I was doing. And you're just flying by the seat of your pants. So until you get exposed to somebody like Steely, Eric, Eric Steele, and we had, uh, he held like a satellite centre. I don't know if he spoke to any other goalkeepers, but I think Mansfield sent the goalkeepers Leicester, Grimsby. So all these goalkeepers, it was a real hub. And it was brilliant because not only did we get to talk all goalkeeping and look at everybody else's goalkeeping gloves and how did they do it? And, oh, how soft is his hands? What about his footwork? Look how he strikes that ball. You're always learning and evolving. But then Steely would go, oh, you're over in the shooting today. And I'd look over and Ravenelli's lining up and I'm like, not ready for this. Yeah. But he's just thrown in the deep end and it's another learning speed. Yeah, it's another yeah. learning experience. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, and from there, yeah, you end up getting bought by Notts County. Like I said, you played 97 games really early in your career and you got bought by Notts County for £150,000. You went on to play over 300 games for them. Uh, I know that you're local to the area. Mm. That must have been amazing. Like getting a move so early on and progressing your career. Obviously, the only way is up, it seems, from there. You played so many games. Yeah, again, I don't think you you recognise that at the time you're aspiring to be better or uh, and with the greatest respect to Mansfield, leaving to go. But I was going up a division, yep. obviously the wage increases. But for me, what it also enabled me to do was to buy my first ever house, to get on that property ladder, uh, to get a mortgage, to to jump in on car share from an area with another. It just, it was, everything's new again. Um but yeah, I, I love my time at Notts County was some of the, I think six years in total, so, some of the fondest memories. And, and we had relegations and we had promotions and we broke some records along the way and come across big characters like Big Sam um, and love my time there. But again, because it's so local uh, and obviously you're going on to another club in a minute, I'm assuming, but <laughs> to, for, for it to be so local uh, and for me to feel so passionate about, it's, just, it's almost a sense of belonging, isn't it? Yeah. It's where you're from. It's it's your, your it's your DNA, it, and uh, and I, hopefully that came across with the supporters because I felt it. I felt as though I belonged at them clubs. You were so established there as well as the first choice goalie, like you said, playing 300 games in six years. You got in two PFA team in the years with the two promotion seasons. I think that was like that must have felt like you were right on the top of your game every week. Yeah, um, and that's not to. To say that the competition wasn't there because come like Mike Polly, Polly came in. What what a, what a human being he is, by the way. Um, and again, you get that you get that drive and you get that. Uh, there's never a comfort zone. You, you you can't possibly be that in that comfort zone. So you're always striving to improve, uh, and that's where you're trying to better yourself. And that's not just even on the pitch. It's the nutrition. Big Sam was somebody that brought a sports scientist in from uh, Nottingham University. So you start learning, you start developing your game. Um, but um, yeah, I always had aspirations to to play at the, the the best level I could get myself to. And then that ended up happening controversially, moving across the River Trent. Well, I swam across the river. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, I was coming to the end of my contract with uh, with Knotts, and I, and I was aware of a little bit of interest from a couple of clubs. Um, I actually spoke to um, Neil Warnock about Sheffield United. He went on to sign Paddy. Uh, that worked out all right. For Paddy, uh, obviously, I'd agreed to go to Forest. Uh, the deal was done. I'd shook hands, and I, I alluded to that, and we sort of said, you know, all the very best, and we'll we'll cross paths at some point, which, which we did. But uh, yeah, to, to go to Forest, that that was just surreal for me. You think some of the goalkeepers, Schiltz, and yep. oh my God, you, you know, Crossley, yeah, yeah so, some some proper proper beginners, Bez, 
Uh, it goes on and on. And even going back as a kid, Hans van Brooklyn, the Dutch, it's lots of like history of goalkeeping. And like you're there, you're the custodian, you've got the jersey, you give a number one. Do you know? Yeah. Massive. In, in fairness, I don't know whether there were squad numbers then. <laughs> Probably not. Just one on a Saturday. But exactly. So uh, loved every moment of, of representing them clubs in, in Nottinghamshire. And then you moved to, to uh, up to the Premier League, to Norwich, uh, and you had a real fight on your hands to get that jersey in Rob Green. And... Yeah. I, I remember going over and uh, talking with Nigel Worthington and Jimbo, the goalkeeping coach, Jim Ullman, who was now at Newport. Yeah. The club are in a position where they're going to have to sell Greeny. Greeny's going, if he's not in this summer window, because I think I signed in the in the August, he's going in the in the January window. Okay, you're our natural successor. Yeah, brilliant. So, um, cartilage done in the Christmas, uh, second operation on my spine, and we're left on the same day two, two years later. Oh, wow. But a great friendship. Yeah. I still speak to Greeny every now and again now. Um, bumped into him recently down here in London. Um and uh, yeah, living abroad now, I think, isn't he? Well, he's had a place up in Harrogate, and I know he's got, yeah, he's got a few bits and pieces going on, but um, yeah, great, great lad. Yeah, that must have been obviously the step up to the Premier League is what I wanted to allude to a little bit. Is could you tell that got you, you've made natural progressions your whole career, and then when you got to the Premier League, was there a giant golf in the standard at that time? Speed, yeah. speed, the tempo of the game just goes through the roof. Um, I think, I think it's fair to say, and again, I mean this with it utmost respect because I've been there the lower league players and it's changing a little bit because they all try and play through the thirds now but it used to be crash bang wallop so play off the centre forward stick it in the channels play off second balls long throws da 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 whatever now it's a little bit whereas at the Premier League and on play and tempo speed of thought speed of thought I was going to say it's just like bang it's gone and if you start thinking about it it's too late so then comes the cream on top if, you know, the, the 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 top players. So I remember going to training, Dean Ashton pulled the trigger from about four yards away. I think I've still got a Nike imprint <laughs> on my thigh now. Honestly, I've never seen anybody hit a ball so hard. A famous football tattoo. Do you know what I mean? It, it's really uncomfortable, but it's like you wear it with pride. Yeah. But I've got to say, just when they run, when they jump, when they tackle, when they strike it, it's just that little bit faster, harder, higher, whatever it might be. And it's just because they're the cream of the crop and, and it comes across in the speed of the play. Uh, you then went to Sunderland uh, under a very controversial manager, uh, Roy Keane. Yeah, you say that. But uh, behind the scenes, he's meant to be the best guy in the world, are they? Honestly, um, I think we all recognise what we see on TV and he, he likes to play the antagonist. And His values were fantastic in terms of what I'd always been brought up with. So timekeeping. So... It's play, please and thank yous. Do you, do you know that the simple, simple little bits? So if you're late, well, you've, you've had from yesterday to get here since I last saw you, where, where whatever. So I, I get all that, but it's just been brought up by, in his football career, Sir Alex Ferguson and Brian Clough. So it's understandable. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. So you kind of see the progression. I had nothing but absolute respect for the manager because you put your bundle in, you got your rewards. So you train as you play. So I think that for, for me, the, probably the issue were that when we started having relative success and we, we got to the Premier League, I mean, secured promotion uh, from the Championship, and then we start bringing in some, shall we call them big hitters. Yep. And all of a sudden they've got, shall we say, an entitlement to play. that they, they, They're going to play. He's just signing for so many million pounds. And then there's, with respect to the likes of Grant Ledbetter and Dean Whitehead and Danny Collins, and we, we'd all come from Oxford and... And and what, wherever Mansfield, that's got had to fight to get. Do you know there. what I mean? So all of a sudden there was that frustration within the camp, but you could see the club evolving and getting better. But going back to the manager, incredible, brilliant. And the club as well. Oh massive, my god, massive club! Wow, the the support, the fan base. Well, we all recognise. We all talk about the North East being a hotbed of football, but I'll not forget we was we was on the brink of getting promotion, and we played Burnley at the Stadium of Light. I think it was on a Friday night live on telly. Uh, I get a penalty away. Um, I think Andy Gray scored it for Burnley. Uh, and then somebody scored an absolute worldie from about 40 yards out. But we go on to win 3-2. And I mean, Carlos Edwards scored an absolute screamer. Like I it, think I remember this It game. could still be going, the ball, if the goal wasn't there to stop it. Uh, we win 3-2. And of course, the stadium's full. And that feel-good factor. 
when you're in front of your own supporters, when it's all going so well, it was just absolutely amazing. A brilliant time to be at that club. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to allude to one of my favourite goalkeepers I've ever seen in Craig Gordon that Sunderland ended up buying. Uh, obviously, I, he took he didn't take your place, but he fought for competition and they played him. Uh, no, he did. He it's, the, it's, the, it's the nicest way I could have put it. Yeah. But what a goalkeeper they end up. Uh, yeah. What what a man. Yeah. I, honestly, I, I still speak to Craig, and I know he's had his injury issues recently, and we we all wish him well. But uh, it looks like he's on that road back to recovery. Um, but he, he's been there before. He's had he's had issues with his knee. Um, but brilliant goalkeeper, and he had them. Like go go gadget arms, arms. it's like almost giraffe style. Mm. It's like Bambi on ice. He'd split them out in this like Schmeichel spread, but it's like it's evolving all the time because they get lower now. And I can't do it double hernia (laughs) twenty years ago. (laughs) But yeah, he 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 had uh, a real calmness, but a real presence, uh, really assured, and a brilliant goalkeeper. Yeah, Uh, like I said, right? Yeah. It's amazing. You, you've played for over 500 games and you've worked and fought off a lot of competition for some top goalkeepers. Like, full credit, Wardy. Like, it's an unbelievable career, mate. Well played. Thank you. Yeah. Right. I, uh, briefly, I just want to touch on your international career as well, uh, playing for Wales. Uh, you made five caps. Uh, yeah. That must have been a huge achievement for yourself, but even more so for your family. And Yeah. Yeah, I remember going back to my time at Mansfield when I first signed the YTS forms, uh, getting some f- uh, some other sheets to fill out, and it was um, y- your parentage and how far that went back, family tree, and of course uh, my mum's side of the um, the tree um, ended up in in South Wales. Um, so I remember getting a call from it was Brian Flynn and and, and Joey Jones, obviously strong connections with Wrexham, yep. um, offering me a chance to join up with the Twenty Ones, and it was me and Danny Coyne. Um, so me and Coyne being the same age kind of um, ended up going Wales B. I actually played at the Wrexham, uh, at the race course uh, against Northern Ireland uh, in this blizzard-like conditions. But we, you, you end up getting into the senior squad. And when I first sort of dipped my toe into the water, um, Bobby Gould, uh, then Mark Hughes, but big Nev, Nev's coming to the end of his career. And I'm travelling to Italy. We're Italy away, Right. And I'm sharing a room with Nev. There's only me and Big Nev on the trip as goalies. And I'm like, so in awe of him. He's Neville Southall. Neville. He grew up as a kid watching him. You know, think of his Everton career yeah. alone. Oh, my God. But some of the stuff he did with Wales as well, phenomenal. And I'm like, this is Big Nev. This is Big Nev. Oh, my God. And then you get to know him a little bit better. And the sarcasm that oozed out of him, he destroyed me. <laughs> <laughs> but, again, it's a learning experience, and, and you take that on board. But... I'll never forget, uh, just, just a little story on that. We, we played Italy. It was the most, it should have been off, waterlogged pitch. Zola played in molds, right? <laughs> he ran the show. They ended up winning 3-0. And we played in, for his warm-up, because I'm thinking, pressure's on, I've got to, I've got to warm, but never, we're playing Italy. Two touch for 45 minutes. That's all he did? Two touch. Oh, and then he's gone, uh, he's obviously gathered what time it is. He says, uh, probably pro- give us some hands. So usual thing, volleyed the ball, caught it, he went, that'll do. Walked off. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, he was man of the match. It should have been 10 double figures and Nev was incredible. Wow. He was just like top, top, top draw. That good or that strong mentally to just all of it, all of it? All of it. His work ethic, he was fit because with respect to him, he wasn't the tallest, uh, but oh my goodness, his work ethic more than made up for his, his lack of hype and his bravery, his heart, his desire. Wow, uh, just another level. And again, for me, right? If I need to do that, that's what I need to to buy into. I might do it my own way, but these are some of the qualities I need to to to, to buy into. Uh, but uh, amazing, mate. Honestly, walking into sharing a room with him. By the way, if there was a double bed and a single bed, you, I'll take a single. I'm not asking. I'm just, <laughs> you're just plugging your bag down straight away. But uh, honestly, that the, the old the old Wales thing. Uh, incredibly proud. Um, and I'll be brutally honest. Didn't know the anthem to sing it, but the tears were str- streaming down my cheeks um, because you recognise what it means to so many people. And even my dad, who was English, born uh, on the outskirts of Sheffield, is like, what are you waiting for? The opportunity with England might not ever come. And when you think of some of the goalkeepers, and I'm, I'm, I'm at Notts County, by the way, yeah. uh, the chance of potentially playing 
at the top, top, top level, you're thinking maybe, maybe not, but this is like a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and of course, you come across some brilliant goalkeepers. You mentioned Norm earlier, Mark Crossley, uh, Big Jonah, Paul Jones. He could make some saves, by the way. Uh, he had this lazy left foot technique. Oh, his left foot was a dreamy yeah, one, yeah, though. Yeah, he just, right place, right time. Yeah. Um, and he went on to make several appearances for Wales, and rightly so. Yeah. Um, but going back to Norm, unbelievably soft hands and a wand of a left foot. Yeah, another one, yeah. But not, not just a wand, a hammer of a left foot as well. So he, he had that feel and touch and, and same with his, his handling skills. Uh, jo joy to kind of observe and watch and learn from and just see their techniques and their traits and their, their cues and triggers and mannerisms and just feed off it. Absolutely brilliant. Unbelievable. Yeah. Right, I just want to touch briefly uh, on the end of your career and how it came to an end. I know you suffered from a few injuries, mm. like your back in particular. I think it was at Sunderland. I think you, you went out on loan, didn't you? I remember the story you telling me because I've suffered in the past with back problems and that. And uh, I remember your advice at the time and stuff like that. So, yeah, if you could just tell how and how you knew when, yeah. when it was. Well, it, it, it was abundantly <laughs> obvious when it, when the moment came. But um, I, I'd had, as you mentioned there, a few injuries, double hernia, and you had your knee cleaned out, you broke your wrist in two places, da da da. Usual stuff that every professional footballer does. But then I started having issues with my back. It was when I signed for Forest, I had all the scans, and they said, listen, you've got some degenerative discs in the in the lower part of your spine, and we need to keep on top of it. So, of course, osteopaths, chiropractors, massages, da 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 whatever. Um, and then it, we played Gillingham at home on a midweek game, went full length to my right. I'm going to say I tipped it onto the post. I can't remember if I did or not. <laughs> uh, it. Ball comes out of play. Uh, a young kid playing for us at the time, Michael Dawson, keeps in play, kicks it all the field, it gets cleared back towards us, then Dorsa's running back towards me and gives me a back pass while well, my back's gone. Like I've popped a disc, got a slip disc. So I, it rolls towards me and I pass it out literally sideways. So it goes out of throw in, for a throw in, like level with my six-yard box. And like everyone's gasping, what are you doing? Of course, I'm in absolute pain. Agony, yeah. I end up leaving Forest. I didn't play again. They signed Paul Gerrard. Go on to Norwich, have a recurrence of that injury, so a second surgery. Uh, anyway, get fit again, get my contract to Sunderland, relative success, and then I'm struggling. Okay, I've had another episode, something's going on. I've had nerve root blocks, I've had epidurals, I've had all these injections, we've all been there. Um, it gets to the point where I'm now back fit again. And Mick McCarthy's coming in for a loan deal. I had a chance to go to Celtic before that, but I wasn't fit. Uh, sorry, Rangers, Neil Alexander went instead. Um I said to the gaffer, Roy Keane, I said, I can't go. I'm not right. I wouldn't do me justice. I wouldn't do yourself. I wouldn't do the club justice. I'm not in a position to go. Okay. He said, have a think about it. I said, I'll come back next day. I went, gaffer, I'm not fit. Right, call it a day. Anyway, as it came about, went to Wolves and I was on the bench. It was when Wolves were going up. Um, They're looking for a little bit of competition. So they were Wayne Hennessy, Carl Akimi. Uh, and basically I've gone in to shore up the ranks. And I sit on the bench, we play at home at Molyneux against Ipswich on a Tuesday night. And on the Wednesday morning, I get the heads up. We've got a behind closed door friendly. It's for those that might need a few minutes. And I'm like, I need to play. Get in up in the next morning, the alarm goes off. And I'm like, I'm going to sneeze. I'm going to sneeze. I feel as like I'm going to sneeze. I go, ah, pff, ah, didn't play again. So the disc just went bosh. And that was it. Uh, I knew at that instance, I'm literally crawling to the door. Uh, God knows how I ever got to the training ground. Saw the doctor, had some more scans. They listened, got an issue, da, da, da. Um, and it came about, it, I ended up seeing the, I remember the scans and they were all printed up. You see the black and white images on the, the white screens and the lights behind them shining through. And they've gone, right, if you want to carry on, I'm not quite sure what level you'll ever get exposed to in terms of standard. And I, the, here's the bit, though. I don't know how long it's going to last. So if we patch you up and have another surgery, you might end up with a rod being stuck through your spine, blah, blah, blah. Or we can call it a day. And if you've got any aspirations to win coaching, you might have 25 years kicking a ball at somebody right hard. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that. Thank you. And that was it. I literally, that that was it. That force you might... That, Done. Uh, I, I knew, I knew. I, you know, you've got yeah. your stomach. You, you know. Uh, and, I, and I felt... I, I've watched other goalkeepers in the past, and you can... You analyse them because you play against people. And I just feel there's certain triggers or certain things you can see. You think they're on the slippery slope. And that's all right because we've all been there. Yeah. We'll all do it. It's just recognising it. And for me, just 
from the medical side, of just it just showed it all up. It was a big full stop, exclamation mark, bang, done. Coach. I, I'm, I'm all ready. Where can I get on my feet? A license, B license. Well, I did prelim when I first started. They was they was non-existent anymore, so I had to do a refresher, da, da, da. And, 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 and here I am today. Perfect. Right, before we crack on with the coaching side then, uh, I want to talk about gloves. Uh, obviously, this is going to be a good aspect because I want to talk about how a coach wears a glove and why you like gloves when you was playing, right? So uh, what are your two perspectives? What gloves are you currently wearing? So as you can see on the table, I'm wearing some night gloves. Um, and I'm going to say that's because I work at the FA. Yep. It's obviously uh, go uh, hand in hand with one another, no pun intended. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it is where it is. Uh, and I think I'm very grateful as we all recognise, hope for no in our <laughs> game, uh, but uh, yeah, they're um, they, they, they get the kind of what I'm, I, I get told to wear, uh, as opposed to what I'd probably prefer to wear. I've asked you off camera: Should goalie coaches wear gloves all day, <laughs> all day, especially in winter because it keeps your fingers warm? <laughs> Look the part, play the part. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I think uh, there's a, there's a time and a place, but I, I, for me, yes, all day, every day. And what did you look for when you was playing in a glove? Um, white. White. Old school. White. Um, obviously, it's all about the palm, but I think as things developed, it's, it's the fit, especially around the back. You don't want that gathering around the back of the glove uh, and you want the wrist strap to be right. <clears throat> Even they've changed now. Some of them don't have wrist straps yeah. and uh, technology. Still but, blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, I generally had a uh, roll finger in terms of the palm every now and again, try ne negative cut, but I, di I didn't like the flat palm. I always felt they twisted and uh, you end up getting the materials down the side of your fingers yep. and it just... No, not for me. But yeah, white gloves um, and and a, and a decent roll finger fit. Did anyone ever custom build them for you? Uh, I think Selzy offered to. I, I think I was standard nine and a half glove though, so <laughs> kind of got away with it. Um, but no, I just think um, it, it's 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 what you feel comfortable in. I know Selzy at the time when I was wearing his his stuff. Um, for me, still so one of the best on the market, and he just had so many different styles that. It, I just I just got on with the uh, the roll finger option that he gave us. Uh, what do you suggest uh, to the young listeners about gloves? What they should look for? I know the parents will say price. Well, absolutely durability <laughs> for parents. I think we've all been there now, especially on these new new pitches that the, the firmer, especially the the uh, the synthetic pitches yeah. and the one, especially the super soft ones when they, they can see see the parents screaming. But for for me, it's all about feel. It, it's, it's down to the individual. Uh, again. Is it is it the depth of the millimetre of the foam? All, all that. It, every, every glove's different, and whether it's two or three or four millimetres, whether it's flat palm, roll finger, negative cut, whether it's a hybrid of all of them, it's whatever suits you. There's no right or wrong answer. Whether you love colours, whether you like them blacked out, whether you like them in white, whatever feels comfortable for you. So on your match day, you're not even thinking about it. You're just happy with your gear. Yeah, whatever pair of gloves you put on and it makes you feel your happiest and you feel like you'll perform your best. And it's a psychological thing. Absolutely. A lot of the gloves all do the same thing now. Yeah. Uh, you could be wearing a pair of pasties for all I care, as long as you're doing the job. You've and seen you me wear a couple of them. A <laughs> couple, only a couple. <laughs> no, it, yeah, down to the individual. As long as you're comfortable and you're you're in a, a good place to play your game, then you crack on. Perfect, right. A couple of months after retiring then, uh, you was only at the game for a short spell really before you, you went in at Peterborough to coach. Uh, how was that tra transition and did you already have your coaching badges? So I was working I was working towards them. I uh, definitely got my B licence, done my B out and B goalkeeping. Uh, but actually I was working in Derby County's Academy uh, on a part-time basis. Uh, I went in there with Darren Wassell um, and... It was whilst I was working there, I got a phone call from Joe Lewis. So Joe Lewis was now Aberdeen. Joe Joe was my boot boy at Norwich. So there's always a connection Small somewhere. World, yeah. So he rings me up. He said, uh, Dibs is leaving uh, uh, Peterborough and the manager's looking for a new coach. He said, he's asked me if I know anybody. Do you, do you mind if I stick your name in the hat? So you fill your boots, mate. That afternoon, I took a phone call from Darren. Before that weekend, I'd gone down to Peterborough uh, I met him after training, we'd had a chat. He said, can you start Monday? It was as quick as that. So I'm going back to, uh, ironically, the manager at Derby was Nigel Clough, who we end up going to work with yeah. latterly at Sheffield United. But uh, yeah, small world. And, and as soon as I'd gone from, I've got to be careful with my words here now, from a development environment in an academy to a 
a professional environment where they're looking to win games. And yes, there's always a development side to it, but it's a cutthroat business at the top, isn't it? You want three points on a Saturday afternoon, come quarter to five, and they'll do more or less anything to get it. And I missed it. I missed that buzz. I missed that match day experience, the lead up, the preparation, the analysis, the set plays, the smell of the dressing room, all that. It's totally different. You miss it. And and it's all I'd ever experienced, as you alluded to earlier, since I'm like 18 years of age. So all of a sudden to be 18 years down the line and not have that, that drug, it was missing. And for me to have that opportunity to go and, and to work with Joe uh, and, and James McEwen, who's been at Grimsby and wherever, it just satisfied that that desire again. And uh, it felt, I've got to say, it felt normal. Yeah. It felt normal. But but you're still kicking ball. You're still out on a training pitch. You're still smelling the latex on the gloves. <laughs> all, all them little bits that we do. And I've I, I got to say, it felt it felt really good. Yeah. Uh, did you already have your badges? I'd say I was, I think I was working towards my A license because it was when Darren went to Preston. I remember uh, getting assessed at Preston. Um, so I, I was on that journey and it wasn't until, because the way I'd been um, invited to take the coaching course was do the outfield playing equivalent first. Gives you a good foundation. It gives you a good understanding. You're building relationships with defensive units, et cetera, et cetera. And your understanding of the game is going to be more so it wasn't until I did me out, outfield a at Preston and I completed my goalkeeping at Sheffield United because I remember Steely coming up um so uh yeah it's, it's stuck stuck in the memory that yeah. a lot of goalkeepers that I've had on have moaned about the fact that they have to do the B license before they do obviously you went and did your A license as well so you really took it to the the next level to make sure that you could cover all bases mm. do you think that's really important Looking back, yes, uh, I, I just alluded to that point in terms of your knowledge and your learning, your understanding, and, and again, it, it's dealing with situations. So and we've all been in environments, say, after training, and you've got like a, a few players, could do some shooting, a bit of crossing. All of a sudden, you've got eight players, and you go, I've never done this before. Well, you might have done now. Yeah. You're dealing with people, and I think that that's what you're looking, right, who have I got? Right, winger, winger. Um, attacking midfielder or she's a city midfielder I tell you what you can say and all of a sudden you've got little drills going up uh, up back and forward and little slides down the side and all of a sudden you're working on your goalkeepers so we're defending the space defending the area we're defending the goal and all these like technical jargon that I'm becoming used to now at the FA and they've got this DNA and yeah it's coming so all of a sudden to have that background and knowledge and understanding of how it all fits together and all of a sudden you're, you're thrown on the spot and you uh, no, the, the girls don't want that now. What, Darren, can you do this? Yeah, come on, let's go. What, who's there? Come that in-depth ready. knowledge you're more of prepared. why you're doing it. Absolutely more prepared, yeah. Right, and then obviously, like you said, you went to Preston before joining Sheffield United. You followed the Darren. Uh, mm. And then once you joined Sheffield United, obviously, I, I remember you coming in. Uh, I was currently uh, at Sheffield United with me and George Long at the time, yeah. weren't it? And we worked together for five years, I think it was, in the end. And I, I just remember your unrivaled enthusiasm, mate. Like, obviously, your sessions were brilliant. Your service ain't too bad either. Uh, used to be, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, I loved your enthusiasm. I know that I could be my own worst enemy at times because I was still fighting week in, week out to try and fight back in the team and that. And I found myself in and out of the team at that time. And I, I must have been hard to work with at times. I openly admit that. But that's that's all part of my learning curve as well. But that's our learning curve. Uh, don't get me wrong, I spoke to you earlier about being a number one, being a number two, being a number three and what them roles entail and how to support not only the team but the group. And that that's also rocking up. I spoke about Mary, turning up every day and putting your bundle in and how can that stimulate the other goalkeepers? And there's more to it than just playing football. But we don't always recognise that at the time because we've got blinkers on, we've got our own careers and even as a young fledgling coach, and I still feel I'm learning and still, you're always buying into them moments. So I've got to say thank you for your words because I, I, I loved working with you and I love I love trying to improve goalies. I think we, we all, we, we're all the same. We, we all eat it, sleep it, breathe it. And it's just like we all want to get better. We all want to do it together. And if I've given anybody the platform to get that little bit better uh, and to influence their thoughts of how they do things and why they're doing it uh, and, and when they're going to do that and how does that look? And who are you going to influence by doing that? And why are you saying that? That all them little bits, then, yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, 
uh, like I said, you, you end up working with some top goalkeepers, especially at Sheffield United. I think you had some really successful years getting promoted from League One to Champ and mm. so on to the Premier League. Uh, obviously, me, Longy, uh, Simon, uh, Jamal Blackman, uh, Dean Henderson. Uh, you've had some amazing goalkeepers that yeah. have come through that sort of that spell with you. You must have a, an undying love for that era of goalkeeping because yeah. I was there. Of course, that goes without saying. <laughs> No, I, on, honestly, mate, I, I feel blessed to have, have have rubbed shoulders with with all them names you've just mentioned, in, including yourself, because their their professionalism, they challenge me every day, uh, in several different ways. Um, but an absolute joy, and whether there were good times or bad times, keep talking about learning moments, but um, real brilliant experiences. Uh, and I've, I've got to say, it turned a bit sour at the end in in the way it all it all fell apart, but. All in all, when I look back at Sheffield United, it's 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 with absolutely brilliant memories. A sub club, yeah. Like, obviously, the fan base is incredible, but I've mentioned it on here before. But the people behind the scenes and the love that they have yeah. for that club yeah. as well. Obviously, I've mentioned uh, the kit man Hobbo yeah. on here yeah. before. Yeah, and, uh, yeah people like that, that. <laughs> it just make that club go yeah. round though. Don't and, they? and and it goes beyond those that you directly come into contact with every every day at the training ground because the people down at Bramall Lane and the officers and uh, you think of Cookie, the uh, the media guy, and just everybody, it just lives and breathes red and white. It's just like, it, it's brilliant. It's, it's so infectious, isn't it? Uh, and it's a brilliant club and, and I wish him well. What was Mark like to work with? Honestly, um, it is, he rocked, I've talked about Mary again, but he rocked up, he delivered every day. We had a couple of good cup runs. We really did, yeah. yeah. Um, and I look back and think, in hindsight, did I have any issues with him? I think, no. It is the things that I think he could have probably worked on to make himself better? Possibly. Did he resent that? Maybe. But Never. I think... There was always that drive and determination, whether that's getting in the t into the team, whether that's staying in the team, whether that's to have relative success on the pitch, whether that's coming back from injury. Um, absolute diamond. I believe you. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't believe you. Yeah. Right, now, like we said, uh, I know you've talked about it briefly, but you, you end up taking on a role after leaving Sheffield United with the Lionesses. How was the transition going from oh dear men's to women's? <laughs> this is the the biggest question that I've wanted to ask actually. Okay, so um, I, I'll never forget the first ever training session. The girls were on their knees. Honestly, I, I've just come away from working with um, Dean Anderson. So we're at top end at Premier League. He's, he's trying to get into the England squad, and everything's at full tilt with Dino. His explosivity. It, it's just a joy to work with, right? So, of course, I've got Carly Telford, I've got Mary Earps, and I think I had Sandy McKeever. Honestly, they were doubled over, breathing, like in desperate trouble. And, I, and I'm thinking, this is like the warm-up bit. Where, where are we taking it? So I'm all of a sudden like on the back foot. And I remember talking to Serena, and I said, I think I've gone in too high. Intensity, demands, qualities, speed, whatever. She went, don't ever change. They need to catch you up. Don't come down and fetch them. Let, let them catch you up. She went, there's been a little bit of a, a dip in terms of reviews from major tournaments. Goalkeeping was always up there in the women's game. And now it's been caught up by the game and overtaken by the game. They've got to catch you up again. Don't slow anything down. Just go for it. I'm like, oof, all right. So got the sports scientist. I says, Do, he came over. He helped flip-flop between the warm-up and they're doing some stretches and bits and pieces. Uh, says, do us a favour, I, I want you to underarm throw this ball to the sports scientist, really flat over the top of this inflatable mannequin, I'm going to get the girls to little punch and then back off, little recovery save, and then they're going to rotate. He threw this ball. <laughs> Honestly, it was the worst throw you've ever seen in the world. I've gone, stop, stop. I said, did you miss his play? So all the girls have gone, what do you mean by that? <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, no. So instantly, yeah. it's just a, oh, dare I say, a throwaway comment that you did. Yeah. It, it wasn't well received. So now the girls have got that to lever against me and use it yeah. as and when. And I'm like, oh, here we go. So I go into the set play meeting and we've spoke. So we, again, you get you get the England group together. And now I'm sort of charged as a goalkeeping coach you, to do with the set plays as well. So looking at uh, with Serena and I and the assistant manager, and we're talking about uh, a win zonal. 
Or we, man marking. There's no, not man marking, are we? It's just marking. What do you mean man marking? It's a team of women. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, of course, I, I bring this up in the meeting yeah. and I remember Nikita Paris. I says, D do you say man market, do you, zonal? Or man, man, she went, we say man on in training. It's all right, buddy. It's all right. <laughs> I was, oh, my goodness. But it's just them little moments. So it's your terminology. Yeah. It's your understanding. It's, it's, it's how that's going to re be received. It's how they're going to use it against you. Yeah. But that all adds to the banter and the, 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 the relationship. Like yeah. So all good, all good. But it's just... It's knowing what to say, when to say it. It's it's recognizing people and personalities, what their traits are, and I think that's the beauty of working with a group. That you need to know people. We get to know you. We work together day in day out. Well, I only see the girls when they come on camp because they're working at the clubs. So that moment of together. How do you how do you build them relationships? And hopefully by getting into the clubs or WhatsApp messages and contact, staining, going to games. All them bits that when you do come on camp that you're all singing off the same hymn sheet and you know what 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 does it feel like today or how are you feeling today? Let's have a look at your reports and what what where are we in your uh, your, your, your menstrual cycle? All, all them bits because before that moment in the month, well the week before the more prone to injury. So all these little bits I'm starting wow. to learn. Yeah. So brand new world for me by the way. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of going back to your questions about the courses. I never ever thought I'd be involved in the women's game, but you've got to be ready. Yeah, just... So can you... So you can increase your learning. What's your knowledge like? Because if opportunity knocks, and we spoke about another goalkeeping coach recently, didn't we, just before coming on air, we don't know when your next job's going to come. Why are you not ready? Well, you don't know about it. Well, find out about it then. So there's all them little bits. Just be ready. Just always learning. Yes. Uh, how has that transition... You've almost answered it for me there, but, you know, going from a day-to-day -day coach to then being an international coach... Uh, obviously you don't see the keepers as much but even your own body I know we've talked about this as well yeah but. it's twofold I think what one I miss that daily contact with the grass uh, interacting with goalkeepers doing your stuff on the flip side my body is just singing with joy but of course you go on camp you you you, you sort of go on camp with all this enthusiasm and then your body lets you down because you instant doms after two or three days for kicking balls or interacting. Serving a thousand volleys t a day after not doing it for a few weeks. Spinning, all that. It, it's soul destroying because you wake up in the morning and look, look for the medicine cabinet to be able to pop some pills to get through the day. But by end of camp, you become accustomed to it again and then you start flying again. But then you're off camp for, it can be months at a time. Um, so I do miss that interaction, but on the flip side, my body's thanking me now after what best part of thirty years plus in in the game that it, it probably needs a rest every now and again. Right, I want to ask you a, a weird question now, but I want you to try and build a robot goalie uh, out of you've worked with so many goalkeepers as a player, as a coach. Right, I'm just going to give you five different subjects, and I want you to uh, mentality, the best goalkeeper you've worked with. I've you got, can include yourself. N well, no, I'm, I'm going to have three. Can, can I, can I, I roll? Going to say you can include me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say Aaron. Yep. I'm going to say Rammers. I'm going to say I Dino. I recently said Rambo as mentality. I think he's so strong. So strong. I say Dino's incredibly driven. So that in itself can be a plus and a minus, but incredibly driven. And Mary. Mary's drive and determination to as she alluded to in her, in her acceptance speech, to, to pick herself up off that kitchen floor and to to get to where she is today is absolutely incredible. Uh, distribution? Ramos and yourself. You could absolutely clout it a country mile. Yeah. Um, and again, um, horses for courses, not going to suggest we played out from the back too often, but in terms of being able to shell it from A to B, unrivaled uh, and I've got to say I didn't enjoy playing golf against you in terms of foot golf yeah, yeah. Uh, nearest the I'd always pick the furthest away pin. exactly <laughs> nobody could ever reach yeah. it's always a par five yeah. for somebody else but yeah uh, Rammers he had that natural gift uh, of being able to manipulate the ball uh, and it's evident now in his, his performances for Arsenal uh, shot stopping uh, you can include goalkeepers that you've played with okay big big nevs obviously okay. spring into mind if you're going to if we're going to open that bracket up Craig Gordon had incredible reach some, some of his saves were eye-catching um, so I'm going to 
I'm going to say Dean's going to be in there as well. Just some explosivity about his work. Oh my goodness, there's too many. There's so there's many, many, isn't there? Right, one against one. One against Craig Gordon. Yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt. Just the octopus eyes. Oh my goodness. It, it, it'd be, it's his timing more so than anything. So um, he'd it, know when to close that space down. He'd know when to slow down. He'd know when to stop. He'd know when or which style of, you call it that blocking technique these days. We always do smother and lead with our hands. It's changed now. And Craig, it, he, his timing was excellent. All right, and the last one, uh, reading of the game. Aaron. Aaron, he's probably head and shoulders above all of them. Uh, but I'm going to also bring the girls into play now because, again, Mary, uh, and again, all, all, the, all the goalkeepers I've worked with, so from Mary and Sandy and Ellie um, and, and, and Hannah and even Emily that I know you spoke about already, Carly Telford, their understanding of the game because they all need to know how it works because they haven't got all the physical attributes a male goalkeeper has. So they all need to know the intricacies of the tactical setup. Are we building with four? Are we building with three? What's the rotation like in midfield? Is it a deep right? How does that look? And they almost jigsaw puzzle it together in front of them, and they see as an overview. So their understanding and reading of the game is also very, very good. Right, superb. That some great answers in there. Some great names. Right, I wanted to ask about Rambo, uh, Aaron Ramsdale. Obviously, you spotted his potential when he first came across from Bolton. I remember him being a spindly little kid when he first joined in. Scrawny. Oh, my God. He was so pale. Yeah. And his knobbly knees. And I've spoken, well, obviously, when he was on here, but you saw him from a very young age uh, after he got released off Bolton and came in with us and spotted that potential. To go on to what he's achieved now, did you think it would no. be that quick? <laughs> no. No. I don't think anybody probably could have forecast and predicted where he's got to. Um, but again, some of the attributes we've spoken about already, he had that raw material in there. Uh, and uh, along with Jamie Anderson, who, who we worked with uh, in, in the academy and the uh, scholarship programme before he kind of migrated to the to yep. the seniors, nurtured that. And I think it's, it's obviously a well-told story about his ability to come back and use the under-16s and what have you. But he had... He had a, a style of goalkeeping that was based upon Jasko Leinen because his best mate's his son. He's, he's, a, he's, an, he's a lad that's been through their system and so on and so forth. And he had that style, that gangly, loose goalkeeping style. And because he had no strength to his body, it looked awkward it did, yeah. and awful, to be honest. So a little bit of, can we do this? But I think that's the beauty of it, that you're working with individuals. It's not like that perfect robot that we'd all like because we're all different. So ca can we maximise what that individual's got? Can we can we make some of them strengths super strengths? Can we improve the weaknesses? Uh, and, and can you develop that goalkeeper? And again, talk about that's not just on the pitch, is it? Uh, so the psychology, the nutrition, the S&C work, the, the, the whole package. Uh, and Aaron's embraced all that, and with his desire and knowledge and thirst... And again, talk about values. What a human being. Oh, a lovely human being. What a man. He, he was always unfazed as well. It's one of the biggest things so I remember calm. about him. Yeah. So calm. Yeah. So, yeah. Hats off to him, mate. He's, uh, he, he deserves everything that's coming his way. Right. And then uh, I've got a final question, right? Uh, I just want to know your goalkeeping idol. Why and why? Like, Obviously, we've all had someone that we looked up to in our career. Some people say family members. Some people will say a goalkeeper that yeah. was the reason why they... Well, it's dead easy. It's my dad. He played for uh, local teams. He had uh, opportunity to play for Workshop Town um, and he had chance to go and have trials for Celtic. And in the week leading up to that, broke his leg and never really went any further. So he was the one that took me out on a Sunday morning when it's lashing down with rain. He was one of the managers at the local club, so he had access to the facilities. So he'd stick a net up, which in our world is amazing. Isn't it? You, you're not having to fetch Just balls. Just don't fetch the balls, yeah. He'd do dipping volleys. He'd work on all them little bits. You'd come home, your mum would wash your kit. Uh, you'd be cleaning your boots in sink. And it's, it's a proper Sunday dinner, isn't it? You, you've earned your dinner because <laughs> your dad's put you through the, the, the mix. But obviously, he's, he's, that's the inspiration. That's my hero. And then you look into the professional stuff. Initially, you look at some of the players that... You're trying to get out of the team. So Jason Piercy, Andy Beasley at Mansfield Town. And then you look at Steve Cherry. And we've mentioned some of the legends at, at Forest. And then all of a sudden, Norwich, you got Gunny over at Norwich. And everyone he's still everyone still talks about Gunny. You've nice got the gun club. The world, Brian. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then 
oh my God, it just goes on and on. You, you get to Sunderland and you've got Monty up there who make uh, FA Cup and oh my goodness. But then as a kid, I'm supporting Man United for my sins. And then I'm looking at all the kits that all the goalkeepers wear as they're, as I'm growing up. And the one that sticks out right at the beginning, just before Les Seeley, would have been Gary Bailey. Uh, and I remember a saving maze at Wembley and it's something that stuck in my mind and I wanted his green goalkeeper's top. And it just stemmed from there. And then obviously you've got your idols, you've worked with people, you mentioned um, Neville Southall. And you come across people like David Seaman, Bob Wilson, his coach, just legends of the game and you're just in awe of them and you're learning constantly and you're trying to, like magpies, we're just yeah. stealing little bits from everybody. Feeding off them. To, to make you more rounded in your approach. But uh, yeah, I'm going to say my dad. Lovely. Well, what an episode this has been. Wardy, I knew it'd be brilliant to have you in, mate, and you haven't disappointed at all. Thanks for having me, mate. Uh, thank you for coming in. What an episode it's been. Uh, that's definitely one of my favourites. This has been the Yours Mine Away podcast with me, Mark Howard, and my mate, producer Ben. Please make sure you go like and subscribe. It really helps our channel grow. All the best, guys. Thanks a lot. What a save from Mark Howard.